Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner became famous when they published their first Freakonomics book in 2005. The two continue to tackle some of the most perplexing questions that we have using their Freakonomics problem-solving approach. Levin and Dubner are out with their third book in the series, Think Like a Freak, and they're joining me now on set to discuss. Uh, so, Stephen D., I'll start with you. <laughs> what does it mean to think like a freak? Well, um, we try to help people solve problems, whatever they are, and, you know, there's a kind of checklist. So this isn't quite a how-to book, but there's a lot of uh, ways to approach problem solving and thinking better. So. Try to get rid of your preconceptions, which is very hard to do, yep. get rid of your biases. Um, acknowledge what you know, but more important, acknowledge what you don't know. We're all very afraid to admit what we don't know. We like to appear more competent and knowledgeable than we, than we are. You, know, you um, say it's very important to say, I don't know. Yeah, three, we say they're the three hardest words to say in the English language, and like the, the smarter and more accomplished you are, it seems the less right. likely you are to say it. Uh, be willing to think like a child, uh, you know, kids, do a lot of things that we as adults can't get away with, but they also have a great curiosity about the world, a way of asking questions that other people might not. And if you don't ask the right question, you're not going to get a good answer. Yeah, that, that jumped out at me as a journalist. You have to ask the, if you don't ask the right question, you're guaranteed to get the wrong answer. So, so Stephen L., I want to bring you in. Mm -hmm. You guys also write that there's some downsides to thinking like a freak. What are the downsides? Yeah, you can make some enemies. We've been, <laughs> we've been throwing out of some meetings. Uh, we were with David Cameron right before he got elected prime minister in the UK. And uh, it was a very about a thirty second really meeting. Short meeting. It was yeah. supposed to be a lot longer, but he didn't like what we said, and uh, and we were thrown out. But uh, you know what we do is we <coughs> we tell people to to think about figuring out the truth and to not worry so much about the repercussions while you're figuring out the truth, and then before you act, you'll bring back the moral compass and what's right and wrong. But but we very much believe in in, in trying to get to the truth and then decide what to do after you found it. So you're not saying throw out the moral compass, but maybe set it aside when you first approach a problem? We think it's that? easier to get to an answer if you use data and you open your mind, you allow any, uh, you know, any possibility to happen, and then then once you figure out what you think is really driving things, then go back and say, okay, do I like the results? So for instance, our most famous controversial result had to do with the, the link between legalized abortion right. and a decline in crime 20 years later. Now, that doesn't mean you know, knowing that that's true, let's just say you believe our result, which I do, uh, doesn't mean you have to change the way you live your life. It just gives you another piece of, uh, of feedback and input into deciding what kind of choices you're you You're not making make. a moral judgment on abortion itself. You're just saying this is what exactly. the statistics showed and exactly. this is your findings, yeah. right? So you also write about the importance of asking the small questions. Yeah, you know, we all want to solve big problems. And if you look at the history of the world and you look at the big pressing problems, whether it's poverty, famine, political dysfunction, whatever it is, a lot of people make a lot of noise about how they would do it or how they are doing it. And, and weirdly enough, those problems don't get solved. Why? Because they're intractable, because you've got thousands of people with competing incentives and interests. So we argue, if you want to be productive, peel off a small part of the problem. Um, you know, we write about an education reform. People would like to have some magic bullet that fixes everything. It's just a ludicrous way of looking at the world. Right. If, however, you can isolate one place where you can make some small gain, not only is there a chance that it will work, but there's a chance you actually get to try it. Most people with big, massive solutions to big problems are really taking a kind of political or advocacy point. There's very little chance of uh, getting it really put in motion. On the, on the right. education point, uh, we write about what some economists did in our book where uh, they were in China and they, they happened to notice that the none of the kids in the Chinese classrooms were wearing glasses. And they had kids themselves. They knew a lot of kids in their kids' classrooms were wearing glasses. So instead of trying to overhaul education in China, they just went and bought glasses for a couple of bucks, gave them to the Chinese kids. And the kids who couldn't see, couldn't learn, and they had dramatic improvements when, when they actually gave these kids glasses. That's, that's a classic example of taking a big problem, turning into a small problem, and making a little bit of progress. Right, so there's a lot of underperforming kids or kids who are struggling in school who maybe just need glasses. Exactly. That's, that's it's a lot simpler in some ways. Sometimes the solution is really simple once you look for it. Yahoo!